Uh, my friends, our second text for this morning comes from Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 16, and we'll begin reading at verse 41. But before we do that, Bible check. Yes, yes, Bible check. Wonderful, wonderful. We encourage you to bring your Bibles when you come to the house of the Lord. All right. Numbers chapter 16, beginning at verse 41. Please listen and read along. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them once at once. And they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with the fire from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Amen. If you would please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you today for your blessings, all that you have done. We thank you for this time and this opportunity, for we know that you're using these things to prepare us to hear your word. So right now, make me less. Allow me to decrease so that you can increase and become more and fix us by clearing our minds, opening our hearts and unstopping our ears so we can hear from you and upon hearing from you. We want to leave this place better than the way we arrived. Yes, Lord, we want to walk out of here better than the way we walked in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would please turn to a neighbor, look at them good, repeat after me. Friend, today's sermon is called Standing Between. Amen. Who was Aaron? Who was Aaron? Aaron was the brother of Moses and Miriam. He was the one that the Lord sent with Moses to Pharaoh to speak for Moses, for Moses had problems speaking publicly. He is, the, he is of the tribe of Levi, but is clearly subordinate to Moses. It was Aaron and Ur, these two individuals who kept Moses' hands lifted in the battle against the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. Whenever Moses' arms were lifted, the Israelites would win the battle. Whenever his arms went down, they would begin to lose the battle. So to keep him from growing tired, Aaron and Ur, one on each side, kept Moses' hands in the air. So they would win, <laughs> yeah, the battle. He was a priest. And history has given Aaron a prime place in the priestly lineage of Israel. His budded staff was kept in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder against being rebellious to God and that God chose him for the priesthood. But these are rarely mentioned when we talk about Aaron. No, you see, Aaron did one thing that was bad. And this is the one that seems to overshadow all of the good things Aaron had done. Yes, Aaron was the one who collected all of the gold. As the Israelites were making their way to the promised land, it was Aaron who collected all of the gold, melted it down, turned it into a golden calf for them to worship instead of God, for them to worship in Moses' absence. So not many favorable things are said of Aaron, if 
anything at all. But in today's text, in this text, it's Aaron who stands between life and death. It's Aaron who saved Israel from another self-inflicted destruction. Now, usually those who are in authority, they have one thing that should never be committed. When I was a kid, my father's one thing was lying. If you were lying, you were in trouble. If you got caught lying, <laughs> you were in big trouble. That was Pop's one thing when we were growing up. But for God, I don't believe that there's a greater sign of disobedience than to rebel against God. It not only states that you're not going to do what God wants you to do, but it actually states, it clearly states that you know better than God. God is wrong, and you know exactly what's supposed to happen. Rebelling, rebelling against God. Now, the earlier verses of this chapter here in Numbers, it shows Korah, Datham, and Abiram, and 250 of Israel's well-known community leaders, they accuse Moses and Aaron of intentionally setting themselves up as elitists, spiritual and religious elitists above everyone else. They accuse Moses and Aaron of robbing them, listen to this, of peace and tranquility that they had when they were slaves in Egypt. They accuse <laughs> Moses and Aaron of taking them out of a land flowing with milk and honey, which was slavery, bondage. That's what they accuse Moses and Aaron of doing. But these accusations are not really against Moses and Aaron. They're against God, the one who told Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And God is not pleased with these accusations. So the Lord is going to destroy the nation, the entire nation of Israel. But Moses and Aaron intercede for them. And God spares the nation. But these individuals, Korah, Datham, and Abiram, and the 250 who bring these accusations against Moses, the earth opens up and swallows them whole. The very next day, the next day, not the next week, not a year later, but the very next day, the same group of folks that Moses and Aaron had saved the day before accused them of killing God's people. And God hears again, and God is not pleased. And again, God decides to destroy them. And at this time, Moses and Aaron can't save them. God has made up God's mind. So God sends a plague throughout the people. And at Moses' request, Aaron puts incense in his burning censer and runs into the assembly where the plague is taking place. Runs into the assembly where people are dying and makes atonement for them. Aaron stood between those who were still alive and those who were dead, separating them so that the living could continue to live. Okay, now Aaron does two really great things here. Really great. First, he puts himself in harm's way. Because the Lord told Moses and Aaron to get away from them. Get away from these people because I'm going to destroy them. The, spread, the, the plague was beginning to spread. But Aaron puts himself in harm's way. He and Moses react to what they are seeing. You catch that? They don't call a committee meeting. They don't do that. They don't send out a mass number of emails trying to get everybody's opinion on this particular incident. They react to what they are seeing, and they react swiftly. And what Aaron does is not the right thing. It's not the expected thing. You see, what should have happened, there should have been a sin offering given. 
and the sin offering would require a sacrifice. But here's the deal. There's no time to get an animal. This is happening right now. There's no time to get a calf. There's no time to get a dove. There's no time to get a goat or a sheep. There's no time to get an animal to make the sacrifice. So Aaron literally becomes that sacrifice. He puts his body on the line with a sweet fragrance in the hopes that that sweet fragrance would change the sinful stench in the nostrils of the Almighty and save as many people as possible. That's what Aaron does. I was working with the church many years ago who wanted to evangelize their community where they were. So I met with this church and I looked at the map that they had, the places where they wanted to go. And they had a big X on a certain spot. I didn't ask any questions. I didn't know what the X was. I thought maybe it was a mistake. So we went on with the meeting. So we came back the following week to meet again. This time, the X was still there. Nobody had removed it. <laughs> so I asked. I said, well, uh, what is this X for? And one of the persons said, that is an area that we would rather not go to. Okay. So when the meeting was over with, I drove to that area. Low income housing area. An area that here in Dallas we would call the projects. Other parts of the country they would call them slums or ghettos. They didn't want to take the word of God to those folks. So I came back following week and I said, I know who lives in that area. And one of the persons just looked at me and said, we don't really think they would fit in with us. I said, what do you mean? Somebody else spoke up bluntly and said, we don't want them here. So I looked at them and I said, really? Well, if that's the case, then they should not be here. Nor should they not be here. Obviously, Jesus ain't here either. And I can't stay here as well. So I left. I don't know what happened to them after that. Many times I think about what happened in the head. I should have, maybe I should have stayed and worked more with them. But I'll be honest with you, they ticked me off. <laughs> I knew that was wrong. I knew it was wrong, and I knew that they knew better. But they did this anyway, so I left. Look, there's a difference and a similarity between the plague in our text and the plagues that we experience in society. The difference is that the plague seen in the text was sent because the children of Israel rebelled against God. The plagues we see today are not always due to rebellion, but they're due to apathy and a desire to pick and choose our own communities rather than to work in and with the communities where the Lord places us. The similarity is this, that there's still plagues, y'all, and we've caused these plagues to happen by either doing the wrong thing or doing nothing. We've got plagues in this country, and plagues in our society, but we're short on the priest end, and we shouldn't be. Perhaps that's my question for today. Where are the priests? Hmm? Where are the priests who will stand between marriage and divorce? Where are the priests? who will stand between those who have a scientific mind but choose to cook meth rather than discover cures for cancer? Where are the priests who will stand between domestic violence and domestic bliss? Where are the priests who will stand between education and miseducation? Where are the priests 
who will stand between love and hate, who will stand between those who know that families have to stay together and those who don't. Where are the priests? Where are the priests that we need? But I don't know where they are, but I can tell you who they are. Matter of fact, Caroline told you who they are just a few moments ago. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And I can tell you what we priests are supposed to do. Jesus says, therefore, I urge you, I mean, Paul says, therefore, I urge you in the view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, God's pleasing and perfect will. You see, my friends, the church has a responsibility. We stand between life and death for all in our families, in our communities, and in society. But so often, we'd rather be invisible. We'd rather be inaudible. And I'm sorry, y'all, but that ain't the church. That's not the church. We don't cower and we don't hide. That's not us. And when we do cower and when we do hide, that makes us a part of the problem. Not the solution. We become plague pushers when we cower. And when we hide. Now, I know, I know, I know this is July 1st, our anniversary, the Sunday before July 4th. And many of us didn't come today to hear a sermon like this. I get that. I get that. I understand that. I do. It's not a popular type of sermon. Now, oddly enough, it's not popular today. It was not popular in Moses' day either. It's not a popular type of sermon. One of the reasons why is because we uphold the separation of church and state. And for a long time, I thought I knew what that meant. I did. I thought I knew what that meant. But when I hear that the homeless problem is the government's problem and the government's responsibility, when I hear that the church should not have any response or take any action when it comes to human trafficking? When I hear that when it comes to AIDS and HIV that the church should not allow their buses to be used to take people to get tested? When I hear that on issues like health care and abortion and equal pay for women and national genocides and even immigration that the church should be silent, that the church has no voice, when I hear that, then I hear another voice. Another voice that loudly and clearly says, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and the devil's angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Jesus says, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison? and did not help you. And he will reply, I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. 
you know, maybe Aaron and Moses didn't do what they were supposed to have done. Aaron at Moses' request. But definitely they did do what they were supposed to do. They did something. Something. Aaron stood in the midst of the suffering. In the midst of the sinful. Even in the midst of the selfish. And interceded for them. We got to do something too. Something like standing between. In Jesus' name, be challenged and be blessed today. Amen.